Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Jo Årset. I am situated in Tromsø in the north of Norway. And today's uh, lecture is about the grey lag geese. Uh, Latin name is Anser Anser. And we've called it uh, too well adapted or too well adapted uh, to its environment. After the um, lecture, uh, I have made a short uh, Kahoot uh, with five questions. So we will uh, have some time, maybe four or five minutes after the lecture, to so that you can uh, answer uh, the questions on the Kahoot. So please have your uh, mobile phones or uh, iPads or uh, PC ready on, on the internet. Uh, yes, <clears throat> let's start. This is uh, a grey lag uh, geese uh, couple uh, running away from the or flying away from the photographer. Uh, it can also uh, look like this. Let's see. Uh, and uh, here you see in uh, uh, this is in the south of Norway in the uh, early uh, autumn uh, and. Uh, hundreds or sometimes thousands of grey lag geese are migrating now southwards and they will land in this um, uh, on these fields and uh, totally eat all the grass uh, that's there so uh, the grey lag geese is uh, feared uh, by farmers not all uh, not only in norway but also in uh, in uh, europe <clears throat> Uh, the grey lag geese uh, is both uh, joy and in its trouble. Uh, it's um, um, uh, just getting some. I don't know. Okay, okay, there. Uh, it's a spring sign. It's visible and it's audible. So uh, people in, for instance, north of Norway, when they uh, hear the geese, they know it's uh, the spring is uh, approaching. Um, and it's a big bird, so it's very visible on the on the sky. Uh, historically, it's used for uh, along the coast in Norway. It's used for uh, they take eggs. Uh, they get some meat uh, from uh, from this bird. And it's traditionally hunted uh, both during the spring and during the autumn. And in Norway, uh, a lot of uh, people uh, eat, as you might know, uh, living along the coast traditionally, fish. So uh, grey lag geese has been a, a very welcome uh, uh, meat source. And also they use feathers for insulation. Um, since 1972, uh, when the grey lag geese population was almost extin extinct, uh, it has increased exponentially. So now it has become uh, also a problem, and a problem for farmers. Uh, and uh, uh, today we manage the population more as a problem than uh, as a resource. In this picture you can see uh, farmers in North Norway. Uh, in this, uh, They have sheep and they are situated uh, with their farm on the outermost islands uh, of the coast. Uh, on the picture to the right, you can see geese uh, arriving and uh, eating grass. This is in uh, May, June, and still snow uh, in the mountains. Uh, <clears throat> and few landowners have uh, some income from hunting licenses, and that's a little bit because uh, geese hunting in Norway is not very popular. Ptarming and hunting is more popular, so it's uh, it's not so many people that do it. Uh, now, uh, as we speak, uh, 20th of March, uh, the geese are on their way to Norway. Uh, this uh, map on the right side shows you uh, how it could be 13th of March, where uh, grey lag geese has arrived in the uh, uh, in the south of Norway and up to. Uh, uh, Helgelandskysten, which is in the middle of Norway. Uh, <clears throat> in the last years, we have seen some early arrival in the south, and uh, six to eight weeks later, they arrive in the north. Uh, but altogether, uh, the geese, the grey lag geese, seems to arrive earlier and earlier every year. And the researchers speculate that it, this might uh, uh, be caused by climate change. And for farmer, farmers, it's a warning about trouble because uh, the season, uh, the grey lag geese eat the grass and the seeds in the soil uh, increase. I'll come back to, to climate change. In Norway, 
Uh, it's a coastal bird, uh, but also shows some signs of increased nesting into the fjords. And as you know, Norway is a country of fjords. If you took all the fjords in Norway and stretch it out, it goes one and a half times around uh, the equator. So it's a lot of fjords with a lot of, uh, of possibilities for the uh, grey lag geese to nest. And that's why Norway is a popular place for it to, to rear its chicks. Um, it's nesting on islands and uh, islets and always with no red foxes. So they choose their nesting place. There should be no red foxes uh, because that's a very, very uh, dangerous predator for the eggs and for the bird because the bird is a big bird and it's not very quick on the wings. It lays uh, four to six eggs, uh, sometimes eight, and uh, therefore it has a large potential for rapid population increase. If um, the grey leg uh, geese couple uh, gets six uh, chicks uh, to to be be raised, then uh, of course it uh, has a lot to say if a lot of couples do this instead of one or two. So this can change a little bit about the weather and uh, uh, how the season has uh, has been. Uh, uh, approximately only 50% of couples succeed to raise their chicks. Uh, so a lot of couples lose their eggs uh, or the chicks are eaten by predators and uh, they might try to lay uh, another uh, uh, bunch of eggs, but uh, that depends a little bit on when the chicks and, uh, are, are uh, killed and uh, a little bit about the time of year when they start. The Norwegian population is about 16 to 30,000 couples, we think. Uh, still increasing uh, and uh, in autumn when the chicks are uh, ready to migrate southwards uh, we estimate the population to be around 150,000 individuals uh, and as I mentioned the population was uh, threatened in 1972 so something has uh, happened and probably that was because uh, the um, uh, uh, income in Norway and uh, the standard of living was increasing, so uh, the people along the coast could uh, get meat from other sources also. So the hunting uh, went down uh, after 1972. Now I will tell you a little bit about uh, physiology uh, in birds uh, and uh, a little bit about the special physiology in, uh, in grey leg geese. Uh, physiology, as you might know, is the, um, it's where you learn about the uh, healthy functional uh, uh, healthy function of organs in uh, uh, your body or a body of an uh, animal. And I will start uh, by telling you uh, about the physiology in birds by uh, telling you about physiology uh, in a human. And now we have focus on the on the lungs, as we all uh, know. We breathe with the lungs. We get the oxygen with the lungs. And you might also know how to how we do that. Uh, and when the chest uh, expands, you get a lower pressure inside the lungs. And when this pressure inside the lungs is uh, lower than the atmospheric pressure outside, then air is sucked into your lungs, uh, shown by these green uh, arrows. Um, <clears throat> so it's almost like a vacuum cleaner. And then when you breathe out, you compress your chest and the lungs are pressed together and the pressure, air pressure inside the lungs increases. And when that pressure uh, exceeds the atmospheric pressure outside of your mouth, then air is pressed, pressed out, uh, shown by this uh, red uh, arrow. Uh, <clears throat> there's only one problem but with our lungs compared to birds. And that is that in this trachea tube, the tube that uh, takes the air down to the lungs, you have, of course, old air from your last uh, breath. And this is mixed uh, with fresh air with uh, a lot of oxygen coming in. So uh, the oxygen concentration in uh, your uh, inbred, uh, inbred uh, air goes down because it's mixed with old, low oxygen air in the trachea tubes. In the birds, it's completely different. <clears throat> they have uh, the trachea coming from the mouth, has fresh uh, oxygenated air, and goes down first to an air sac. 
And birds have several air sacs, both uh, posterior and anterior, which pumps the um, uh, air around. So when uh, the air has fresh air has arrived to the first uh, posterior air sac, you can see that uh, the air sacs are expanding, as I mentioned now, uh, to to get a uh, low pressure and to suck in the air. Uh, then, uh, when the air sacs are uh, uh, compressed, uh, the fresh air is coming into the lungs. And you can see here a picture of uh, small uh, air tubes where oxygen is taken into the blood and CO2, carbon dioxide, is going. Uh, no, uh, oxygen is, is taken out of the blood, of course. And um, uh, no, sorry, oxygen is taken into the blood and CO2 is uh, taken out. So uh, uh, um, when this fresh air now has passed the lungs, then it goes out through the same trachea system and out to the outside world. So it means that you have no mixing of old air uh, with low oxygen, that's in the trachea tubes or in the lungs, uh, with fresh air. And that, again, means that birds have... Uh, 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 take take uh, out a lot more oxygen from the air than we do because they have fresh air available in the lungs all the time. And that's partly uh, the explanation uh, for why birds can fly so high, why birds can fly, for instance, over the Himalaya, where the uh, oxygen concentration or the pressure of oxygen is very low. So that's why uh, birds are able to do that. Uh, <clears throat> this shows you uh, uh, just a picture of a seagull and uh, shows you how many air sacs a bird can have. So not only if you talk about posterior air sacs, you have several. And if you talk about anterior air sacs, you have also several. And of course, remember that uh, a bird can fly because it's a light uh, animal. Uh, the uh, bones are filled with air, so it makes it uh, much lighter. You know that when you, you break a chicken bone. It's, it's hollow, and of course the air sacs will also help the bird to be lighter. The, the bird contains more air at the same time. Uh, <clears throat> when um, uh, you see, uh, this is a picture of, of uh, uh, the eye, and on the back of the eye you have the retina, and the retina consists this is uh, just a piece of the retina wall, which shows uh, all the cells that you have in the retina. You have uh, rods and cones. Uh, rods are extremely sensitive, and they are responsible for gray tones, black and white uh, perception. Uh, cones, uh, they are responsible for color, and they are uh, less sensitive. So they need more light to, to uh, work. And this is the explanation that in dim light, uh, it is difficult to see true colors uh, because the cones are not uh, working because it's too less, uh, less light. And that's why all cats appear gray uh, in dim light. Uh, <clears throat> you have some uh, among all the other cells, which I will not come into now, you have uh, amacrine cell or amacrine cells. And all of us have those cells. And the, um, uh, the purpose of the amacrine cell is to detect movement uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, your, in front of you. So all uh, uh, predators, but also all animals that uh, are fearing a predator, have a lot of amacrine cells because that can help them to detect movement uh, in, uh, in the horizon and therefore uh, alarm them to either run away or for a predator to alarm them to see that there is a, uh, something to eat there. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, the uh, gray lag geese uh, or goose has extreme high amounts of amacrine cells. And uh, this is why the uh, gray lag uh, geese is very good at detecting movement in the horizon. Uh, probably this is because it's a big bird uh, which uh, is not very quick on the wings and it's not uh, easy for it to fly back and forth. It has just to fly in a straight direction and it's easy to capture, for instance, for an eagle. 
Uh, and that's why it's very important for a big bird when it's on the ground to have a lot of these amacrine cells to detect all danger. So gray lag geese is actually one of the birds and also animals that has the most amacrine cells uh, among, uh, in, in the animal kingdom. So more biology. Uh, the gray lag uh, geese uh, adapt uh, uh, very well to multiple changes, both natural and man-made. Uh, the bullet mass is approximately three and a half to four and a half kilo, and they are fertile after two to three years, and they have a wingspan of 180 centimeters, and after eight to ten weeks old, they are able to fly. Uh, we divide the gray lag geese in two groups, the non-nesting, which is yearlings, non-fertile or failed nesting, and nesting geese with uh, eggs or chicks. Uh, as mentioned, they have excellent vision, uh, and they are especially uh, uh, excellent in detection of movement, amacrine cells in the retina. Uh, when uh, a pack of, uh, let's say, 30 geese land, they have uh, guard geese uh, that follow, uh, uh, that scans the uh, horizon and uh, the uh, area around. And when these guard geese are happy, uh, say that it's okay, uh, or signal that it's okay, all the geese starts to eat. So someone is always watching. Uh, they can actually submerge themselves uh, underwater uh, and blend in the seaweed. So if they are in uh, water and they are threatened, they can actually go down under the water. Uh, the researchers don't know why, how this is possible. They have tried to find it out, but it's, it's uh, very difficult because, as you know, the feathers uh, 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 is, uh, if, you, if you push a, a, a geese or a bird underwater, a, a seabird, then it will come up again because the feathers is oiled and they have also a lot of air sacs. Uh, so we don't know how it's possible for a geese to go down uh, underwater and stay underwater uh, like they do. But it's a very, very uh, special adaptation. It's an opportunistic feeder meaning that it can eat, it eats mainly grass and, and herbs and, uh, and plants. It's not a seabird in the, in the sense that it eats fish or, or, uh, or shells, uh, but it can also eat berries. Flight speed, uh, approximately 100 uh, kil uh, kilometers per hour, uh, but of course wind can increase speed considerably. And the record uh, detected is, uh, or uh, the record uh, is uh, 24 hours from Denmark uh, to Svalbard, uh, indicating that the speed was approximately 250 kilometers per hour. So uh, in that case, it had some favorable winds. Uh, <clears throat> it has a special flight mode, as you have all uh, probably seen. Uh, it, flows, uh, it flies in a, in a plow. And this plow saves uh, energy. Uh, first of all, it saves 20% uh, uh, energy by reduced air resistance, and approximately 15 to 40% energy is saved, saved uh, by the geese flying, uh, flying in slipstream of each other, like a, a, a pack of cyclists in, uh, during Tour de France. Uh, and they change uh, uh, on who's in front because it's more energy uh, demanding to be in front. So you can see that the, the geese, they, they change position and uh, half an hour later, the geese um, uh, uh, in the back of the pack will be in the front. Uh, every year the geese uh, molt, they change their feathers. And why? Well, uh, all birds need to change their feathers at least once a year. Uh, because wear and tear uh, will uh, take down the quality of the feathers and some feathers more than others. And of course, the fly feathers is the feather that is most exposed for wear and tear. Um, and uh, some birds change their large flight feathers gradually and keep their ability to fly. But the ducklings, Anseriformes, which uh, gray lag -like is, is, is a duckling, they molt all their large flight feathers at the same time. And that's why they can't fly for about three to four weeks. 
and uh, <clears throat> during this period they seek safe places in or close to the water or sea and keep a very low profile. In this period the grey leg geese uh, are very vulnerable and shy and are difficult to spot and in uh, the grey leg uh, goose molt in July every year. This picture shows you molting grey leg geese at sea and they are now swimming around, they cannot fly so they are swimming in the, in the, in the sea uh, packed together to uh, avoid predators because now it's an easy target uh, if they are on land. And this molt uh, of course demands a lot of energy. Uh, if you look at this uh, graph, you have uh, the length of the flight feather, number 3, in millimeters on the x-axis, and you have the weight in grams of the bird. Young, female, no, young males with the red dots and young females with the blue dots. And you can see that during the molt, uh, where it's, they're not actually eating a lot uh, either because they're at sea, uh, the uh, body weight decreases dramatically. So after the molt, in the end of July, they need to eat a lot to, um, to get back to their uh, uh, best body mass, to get the body mass back and be able to migrate southwards uh, that they do in Norway in, in the autumn. So in three to four weeks, the geese lose about one kilo in body mass and they must regain this before the migration. And this shows you grey leg geese in the natural in its natural habitat. Uh, it's berries and grass. Uh, sugars are important for gaining weight after the molt. You can see an adult bird here and here, and you have uh, five chicks in this picture. Uh, <clears throat> changes in the annual rhythm. Uh, as I mentioned, it seems that the grey leg geese arrive earlier in Norway and that uh, nesting and migration is also earlier and advanced by three to four weeks. We have found uh, um, a correlation between uh, uh, the temperature in Holland, where the uh, uh, grey lag geese overwinter, the grey lag geese that uh, nests in Norway, and we have seen that it's correlated with the temperature in uh, Holland during the winter. Uh, and in the uh, last uh, decades, the temperature, uh, average temperature has increased from 6.1 degrees to 7.9 degrees. And we can see that the arrival in Norway is earlier and earlier as the temperature in Holland increases, meaning that the geese uh, think uh, that, okay, it's spring now, uh, the temperature is correct, we go to Norway. And uh, the arrival has... Uh, 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 advanced from 4th of April approximately to approximately 20th of March, so today actually. Uh, so the explanations for this is uh, climate changes, uh, could be that the saltwater plant weed, which uh, is eaten by the grey lag goose in Holland, disappears. It could be hunting selection, it could be changes in molting pattern, uh, also, it could be that they want to migrate from Holland before the uh, hunt starts in Holland. Also, <clears throat> the date for the first registration of chicks uh, has advanced from uh, approximately, well, uh, number 135 is 15th of May. So, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, approximately June, uh, July uh, to down to May, so one month uh, advance in the first registration of chicks. Okay, the problem for the farmer. Uh, it arrives early and earlier and earlier, increasing in numbers. They eat the seed in the soil. The seed for the grass is placed in the soil. And uh, in this seed, all the energy that is going to make the, the grass is concentrated. So the seed is high in energy. So the um, uh, grey lag geese, or also other geese of course, uh, they put their uh, beak down to the soil and take the seed. So they actually take the grass before it's grown. Uh, <clears throat> it could eat approximately one kilo uh, of wet weight grass every day. So if you have a pack of let's say 100 geese, uh, they will eat uh, 100 kilos of grass uh, every day. 
and this is grass that is meant for the uh, husbandry, uh, sheep, goat, goats, uh, cows. So it's of course a problem for the uh, for the farmers. They eat selectively, meaning that they eat the grass that it looks the best and probably is the best uh, in energy. Uh, they uh, leave a lot of droppings, uh, which uh, uh, will come with the with the grass when the farmer is taking the grass uh, in. Uh, so it takes down the quality of the grass uh, with the grease, uh, the geese droppings, and we're talking about uh, as much as 40 geese drop, uh, droppings per square meter in the worst uh, cases. Also, it treads down the grass. So when it treads down the grass, it's difficult for the harvester to take the grass uh, in. Solutions for this. Uh, for this, what, what has the farmers tried to do? Uh, they had tried to, to scare it away with sounds and scarecrows, uh, but this has just a limited uh, uh, effect. Uh, maybe just one day, two, three days, then the geese know that uh, this is just a fake scare, so they're not afraid anymore. Uh, the farmers have tried to be active uh, around the fields. That could also help a little bit, but also uh, not uh, just for a short while, because the geese don't... Uh, a look at the activity as a danger for them, so then they um, uh, continue eating. Uh, dogs have been used, uh, but uh, with uh, with uh, the, the dogs doesn't get hold of the geese because it will fly, so the dogs uh, very easily get uh, tired of this. So that's not been a success either. Uh, derogation shooting, uh, meaning that you shoot a few geese. Uh, because they have do damage to the fields and you shoot them uh, outside of hunting season has been very effective because when the geese register because they do that that some of them actually are killed some of them are actually uh, left behind then they really start to to uh, look at the field as a dangerous area and this has uh, been the best uh, solution for the farmer uh, it's not the population uh, regulating activity. Uh, maybe they are allowed to shoot five geese or ten geese uh, in an area where you have, let's say, 500 geese, uh, and this could be enough. So you don't kill a lot of them, you only kill some of them to make a signal that it's dangerous to be here. <clears throat> of course, hunting. Uh, will also help, but that, that is only in the hunting season. And in Norway, uh, the hunting season goes from uh, 15th of August in north of Norway and 1st of August in south of Norway. Uh, but this uh, hunting season is probably too short because the geese start their migration before you, the hunters are able to shoot so many geese. <clears throat> this picture shows you just filmed through the uh, to the uh, scope of a, of a rifle it shows you how uh, a geese uh, actively feeds very quickly uh, this is in spring in may and uh, uh, feeds very actively in just this short second it takes maybe 8 grasses uh, <clears throat> Let's look, look a little bit about uh, on, on the hunting statistics. Uh, young birds um, are shot more and more, and you can see that the increase in population also shows you the increase in uh, in how uh, many geese are shot. Uh, we shoot more and more young uh, birds compared to older birds because uh, the population is increasing. Uh, so if we go back, uh, this is a little bit also coupled with uh, that you have some a little bit more hunters now than you had in 1993, but anyway the population is increasing. Uh, this shows you the migration route for Norwegian and grey leg geese. Uh, some geese uh, migrate to the Baltic, uh, Baltic Sea uh, and migration routes might change and adjust to climate change. We don't know that. Um, so. You can see that uh, the Norwegian population, they overwinter in Denmark and Holland, uh, Belgium and uh, Belgium, Belgium and, uh, and uh, uh, Spain. Uh, how geese react to hunting? Uh, as you can see, uh, this is uh, early start in, uh, in south of Norway. 
the number of geese shot goes dramatically down as the hunt uh, proceeds. So uh, one month later, it's not possible to shoot any geese at all. And this is uh, uh, the reason for this is uh, both that they are starting to migrate away from the area and also that they will leave an area if you hunt too much, then they will scared. Also, this is correlated with the number of hunters that actually uh, get the geese or shoot the geese. Uh, you can see that this uh, goes down. Uh, also, uh, the geese, uh, most geese is shot in the morning because they arrive when it's dim light during the night to start uh, eating and they eat for five, six hours. Uh, and then in the early morning, let's say 10 o'clock, uh, they will leave and relax and digest the grass that they have been eaten during the early uh, hours.